Good morning. It's good to see all of you. On behalf of the Midway congregation, we want to welcome our guest, and we're especially grateful to you for visiting with us. Uh, today, our opening prayer will be led by Thomas Brignark. Our singing will be led by Grant Addison. Our lesson will be by Mark Howell, the Lord's Supper, by Ben Lawler, and our closing prayer will be led by Charlie Dunn. At this time, we'll enter our worship service. If you would, please uh, remind yourself to turn off all of your electron elect electronics and uh, so when our worship is not interrupted. Thomas? Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time we've had to come together to worship you, and we pray that our worship is pleasing in your sight. We pray that you be with those that are not able to be here today due to whatever reasons, Lord. We pray that, um, that their love will be felt by you. Um, we pray that we can uh, be a light to those around us and that uh, you be with this country and allow us to uh, make a difference to those that we come in contact each, each and every day. Please forgive us when we fail you. We pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. this morning. Glad that you're able to be here with us. Thankful that we are all, all are able to assemble and appreciate so much the fact that you've chosen to be with us today. 
According to the Alabama Retail Association website, nationwide this year, there will be $37.1 billion spent on kids who are going back to school. That's a lot of money, is it? $37.1 billion. Now, living here in Alabama, again, according to the Alabama Retail Association website, from those who are in first or rather kindergarten through uh, 12th grade, there will be an average of $848.90 that is spent on going back to school. Now, some will spend more, of course, some will spend less, but the average is $848.90. For those who are headed back to college or to some university, on getting ready to go back, there will be $1,200.32 spent on average. Now, again, some will spend more and some will spend less, but either way you look at it, that is a lot of money. When you start thinking about the, the, the parents and you know the, the work and, and, and all of the things that go into getting kids ready to go back to school, it takes a lot, and so we all know that. And not only that, but we know that there are a lot of items that children pack up to go to school and, and young people have to have in order to go to school. I'm sure you still have to have those number two pencils like we used to have. Uh, you have to have things like uh, a backpack and a, a highlighter and erasers and maybe a three ring binder and some uh, loose leaf paper and uh, a, a spiral notebook and things like that. There are all kinds of things that we know of, and actually I got on the, the Jasper website, you know, the Oakman website, and I looked at some of the things that ch kids were to bring back to school this year, and I know these things were on the list as well. And so we think about going to the store and buying things in order to go back. You've got to have those new clothes and things like that. But let me just suggest to you this morning that there are some things that you need to take back to school that you can't go to the store and buy. Not everything that you need to take to school can be bought in a store. And so in looking at the, what we're going to cover this morning, I know that in generations past, it seems like big problems were things like chewing gum and things like that. And, and even later on, smoking in the bathroom became a problem. And things have progressed, it seems, even since I was in school back in the 70s and early 80s. There is a lot of difference, it seems, in the way things happen at school. You know, young people today have to deal with several challenging things when they go back to school. They have drugs and depravity that's present. They have alcohol and what I simply call abominations that they have to, to deal with. They have fornication and felonious acts. You know, there are felons who come in. I think I even heard this past Friday there was uh, uh, someone, I don't even remember what state it was in, who came in and shot some students as well. And, and so we have all of these things, gangs and guns and the undisciplined and the ungodly that takes place. And so our kids are facing these things when they go back to school. But as we think about going <coughs> back to school and what we need to be taking with us back to school, I want to suggest three things this morning that you need to remember in great detail. Number one, let me suggest that you please take with you honesty and integrity to school. Take that back with you. Now, what are we talking about when we're talking about honesty? Well, honesty is the state or quality of being honest. But, I, you know, I don't like the, the way sometimes the dictionaries define these things. You know, what is, on, what is being honest? Well, when we think about that, it's refraining from things like lying and cheating and stealing. It's talking about being truthful and being trustworthy and being upright. That's what we're talking about when we're talking about taking honesty back to school with us. And then we have the word integrity. What do we mean by the word integrity? Well, the word integrity is defined as following moral or ethical principles and doing the same as what you say. In other words, you follow the rules, you follow the good things that, that come to us from things like the Word of God, 
And, and you, you follow those rules, but you don't just say that you're uh, a believer in these things and that these things are good and right. You actually follow through. You actually do the things that you say that you need to do. Another definition of integrity is steadfast adherence to a strict moral or ethical code. Now, when we think about honesty and integrity, the New Testament encompasses both of these things in, in uh, its uh, teaching to us. Let's look at the book of Romans chapter 12 at verse number 17. The Bible says, Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. Here's our concept that's given here to do what is honorable. If you read that from the King James Version, it simply says, do what is honest in the sight of all men. The word that's used here is from the word which means simply good or of good quality. The definition continued on is simply this, possessing moral excellence, worthy, upright, and virtuous. And so when we're looking at the word that's used here in the English Standard Version translated honorable, it's somewhat encompassing both the idea of honesty and integrity in the same word. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 8 at verse number 21. Paul wrote and says, For we aim at what is honorable not only in the Lord's sight, but in the sight of men. Now obviously the Lord's Rules are those that take precedence over everything else. And if man's rules are not in accordance with God's rules, then certainly we can't strive to, to please them and, and, and their made-up rules today. Okay, But when both are matching, then what we're seeking to do is, is to live honorably, not only in the sight of God, but also in the sight of men. Now, it may be that in our day and time, the moral standards have changed, and when you're standing for what is right, you're not pleasing mankind, and you're not pleasing the morals and the, the, the uh, uh, uprightness of, that they hold here. But as long as they're seeking again to do what is right, we're trying to be pleasing not only to God, but also to men. When I think about that, I think about Jesus as he was growing up. He grew in favor with God and men. Again, not only that, but in the book of 1 Peter chapter 2 at verse number 12. Peter would write and say, Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. As we think about this again, Peter is, is encouraging us to do exactly what Paul has encouraged us to do in both Romans and 1 Corinthians, or rather 2 Corinthians. But again, there are those people who would, who, who would uh, 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 say bad things about you for doing what is good and what is right. But as we look at that, even those people who would say bad things or maybe even attack you in some way for doing what is good and what is right, even they will have to admit, even they will have to say at some point, hey, I saw what you did and, and now I know. Even if it's waiting for the day of visitation, in other words, the day when Jesus comes back and we all stand before Jesus in judgment. And so they can look at you and say, I wish I could have been like you. I wish I would have been like you. And they will glorify God for you and what you did while you're here. If you take your honesty and if you take your integrity and live in the way that God wants you to do, even at, at school. But now, let me call your attention back to the book of Romans chapter 12 at verse 17 and 2 Corinthians chapter 8 at verse 21. In Romans chapter 8 at verse 21, or Romans chapter 12 at verse 17, Paul uses the phrase, give thought. 
And in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 at verse 21, he said to aim at this honesty or being honorable uh, before all men. Now what does it mean to give thought to or to aim at? Well, uh, the idea behind that is simply this, to think about something ahead of time. That's the definition of the word that's used. And it has the implication that one can then respond appropriately in whatever situation he or she finds himself or herself in. We have to think about it beforehand. You know, I heard the phrase a long time ago. It goes like this, dead men don't make decisions. In other words, when we have died to our sinful life, we are deciding at that point to try to live the Christian life. In the book of Romans, chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin live, still live in it? Again, going back to that phrase, dead men. We died to sin. We died with Christ, if you will. We should have made the decision at that point that we're not going to compromise our honesty and our integrity along with other things. We are dead. Dead to sin. Not only that, but in the book of 1 Peter chapter 2 at verse 24, He Himself bore our sins in His, own, uh, in His body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness by His wounds you have been healed. We are to have made those decisions. It should not be uh, a Monday morning thing when we get up and get ready to go to school or we get ready to go to work. We've already made the decision on that day and we made it a long time ago when we became a Christian that we would take our honesty and our integrity with us. And so, how does that apply? When it comes time for an exam, you already have made up your mind that you will not cheat. When interacting with your teachers and you've already made up your mind that you won't lie or do some kind of thing that is not uh, uh, good. Uh, you know, the, the, the old excuse, the dog ate my homework. Let me just tell you, your teacher's already heard that one and knows that it's probably not true. And, and, and there's probably no excuse that you can come up with that they haven't already heard. Now, I know we've got teachers here and you've probably heard some of the best excuses that, that people can think of. But if we're just tr trying to lie our way out of, uh, of failure or lie our way out, we're not taking our honesty and integrity with us. When your grades are not what they should be, be honest with yourself. Did you really put forth the effort that is necessary in order to get the gray. Be honest with your parents about your activities and what you and your friends are planning on doing. Be honest with them. And so I suggest to you this morning, be sure that you take your honesty and your integrity to school. Number two, please take respect for authority to school with you. Please take respect for authority back to school with you. When we talk about not having respect for authority, we mean simply this, someone doesn't follow the rules or behave according to the conventional expectations or who openly or contemptuously, that is with contempt, defies the guidance of persons who are in leadership roles. You know what I mean when we're talking about respect for authority. But let me just suggest to you some ways that we can disrespect authority. Now there are a lot of things on the screen up there that you'll see. Talking back, mocking, being defiant, being on your phone, being sarcastic, angry or rude, outburst, pushing or throwing objects, spiteful behavior, backstabbing behavior, refusing to, to do tasks, stubborn about doing things your own way, staring or glaring, sighing, making gestures, 
pointing, making faces, raising eyebrows, rolling eyes. You may not be outrightly just jumping up and giving some kind of protest like you see in the streets today. But by doing these little things, you know what you're doing, young people? You are showing disrespect for authority. And it goes all the way through. And we need to make up our mind even before we go that we're not going to do these things. And you know what? Making matters worse today is that the media, the, the television and the radio and all of the things that we see on the computers, they, they seem to, you know, hold up, if you will. They, they seem to... Uh, to, to portray the disrespectful teenagers as those who are cool and those who that you would want to be like. And that's not the case. Not the case. Listen to me. That is not the case. We need to find some good Christian heroes in order to look up to them and try to be like them and imitate them. In the book of 1 Peter chapter 2 verses 13 through 20. Listen carefully to what Peter wrote. He said, Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme, or to the governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing when mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is the gracious thing in the sight of God. Now did you get that? I know that was a long reading. But let me see if I can translate it. God wants you, first place, to respect authority. No matter who it is or where it is, God wants you to respect authority. And even if somebody mistreats you, even in places and with the power and authority over you, even if you're mistreated, how do you act? You act like a Christian. You act like God wants you to act rather than retaliating and doing those kinds of things. Good friends, young people, all of us, we need to be sure that we take respect for authority wherever we go. And if we don't, we're going to have a problem. Look closely again at Matthew chapter 8. And let's look at verses 5 through 10. When he entered Capernaum, a centurion, a centurion is someone who has authority over a hundred soldiers. He said, a centurion came forward to him, appealing to him. Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, suffering terribly. And he said to him, I will come and heal him. But the centurion replied, Lord, I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only say the word, my servant, and my servant will be healed. Now watch his argument. For I too am a man under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who followed him, Truly I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. Imagine what Jesus is, is thinking as he hears this man. This man says, you don't even have to come to my house to heal him. I know that you can speak and it will happen. I know you have authority over the disease, the problem, the sickness that is afflicting my servant. I know that you do that. 
And I know that I myself, I, I listen to those who are above me, my commanders who are above me, because I'm under their authority. And I know those men who are under me. When I speak, whatever it is I speak, they listen to me because they are under authority. And all of this that plays out, notice what Jesus said. There's no such faith that I found even in Israel. Good friends, this man had faith in Jesus, but he had faith in authority as well. And so we need to have the same kind of thing. When we think about the idea of authority, without respect for parents, there will be no respect for teachers. Without respect for teachers, there will be no respect for law officers or civil authorities. And without respect for these governmental authorities, there is no respect for God. Now that's as simple as I know how to put it. If you will not listen to mama and daddy and you disrespect your teachers and following that you continue to disrespect those who are uh, the civil authorities or the governmental authorities, it all boils down to this. You do not respect God. Listen to me because I'm pleading with you because we're living in a day when there is so much being said against civil authority, so much being played up in the media against civil authority, if you fall into that crowd, you are slapping the face of God, showing disrespect to Him. Good friends, that's an important thought that you need to hold on to and that you need to take with you. Then number three, please take moral courage to school. Moral courage. When you go back to school, take moral... What are we talking about when we're talking about moral courage? Well, moral courage is the courage to take action for moral reasons despite the risk of adverse consequences. In other words, it simply means to do the right thing even at the risk of offending someone inconvenience, ridicule, even punishment, whatever it is, you continue to do what is right. Now, moral courage frequently requires us to put aside compelling but momentary pleasures or comforts on, in order to do what is right. We can't just do everything or anything in our life. Now the Bible provides us some examples of moral courage. We could go back and talk about this morning Joseph in Genesis chapter 39 when Potiphar's wife wanted to sleep with him and he fled from her. We could talk about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the book of Daniel chapter number 3 and how they had the courage to stand against the king to the point of being put into the fire. And of course, God protected them. We could go to Daniel chapter 6 and see young Daniel as he stands up for prayer and doing what's right, and he is put into the lion's den. The Bible gives us example after example in regard to moral courage. But in what ways will young people today face situations where they need to have moral courage, to be willing to stand up? Well, let me list a few ways this morning. Number one, there's a challenge requiring moral courage in regard to modesty. To how you dress when you go to school. Now we know, 1 Timothy rather, chapter 2, verses 9 and 10 say, Likewise, also that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire but with what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works. Now, even though this is written in the context of coming together to worship, the same is true wherever we are. We can't dress immodestly. We can't dress in a way that is not respectable, if you will. We can't show more skin. Listen to me, girls. We can't show more skin than what we don't show. Young guys, we can't do the same kind of things 
as girls do. We need to have some moral uh, courage when it comes to modesty. But let me also suggest to you that even applies in sports. It applies in band. It applies in every extracurricular activity in school. Be sure that you are modest, that you dress appropriately and respectably as God has put it. Number two, there's the challenge of moral courage in regard to alcohol and drugs. In the book of 1 Peter chapter 4 verses 1 through 5, Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking, for whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do. Now, what did the Gentiles want to do? Living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. And re with respect to do this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery and they malign you. But they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. Yes, they will give an account because they malign you, but you will give an account if, if you fall in with them and you join them. And, and did you notice some of the things that he said? The drinking, the drunkenness, the drinking parties. If you're invited to a drinking party and you think the cool kids are going to be there, what do you do? Well, the thing a Christian would do is not join in. It may be unpopular for you not to go. It may not be what you want to hear from those who are around you. They may say bad things about you. But that's okay. That's good. That's fine. Because one day they'll stand before God and they'll have to answer to Him for not only the partying and the things that are done, but for saying bad things about you. Take your more courage with you when it comes to alcohol and drugs. In the book of Habakkuk chapter uh, 2 verse number 15, there Habakkuk writes and says, Woe to him who makes his neighbors drunk. And we're talking about alcohol and drugs. And so we could, we could apply this to both, either one. Woe to him who makes his neighbors drunk. You pour out your wrath and make them drunk. Now, especially young ladies and young men together, why it is a big reason that they do that? Now look at the verse. You pour out your wrath and make them drunk in order to gaze at their nakedness. Listen to me, young ladies. One of the main reasons that young boys want to get you drunk is because they want to get you in bed. And that's not Mark saying it. That's God saying it. Listen to me carefully. Young men, you better not be doing those kinds of things. Take your moral courage with you when it comes to alcohol and drugs. Here's another one. Another challenge requiring moral courage is in the realm of dancing. In the realm of dancing. We don't hear as much about that today as we should. Preachers don't preach about it probably as much as we should, but it is a problem. In the book of 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22, flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. We don't, we, we don't want to... Uh, spike these passions, if you will, that take place between boys and girls when those hormones are racing. Okay, We don't want to spike those things. And so the Bible says, flee youthful passions. Let me read you, and you can read with me, something that uh, Alan Webster has written. Uh, he actually quotes from Paul Southern. It's in his uh, book, Should Christian Teens Dance, or not a book, but a, a tract. And it goes like this. 
Paul Southern wrote that dancing is like building a fire under a tea kettle and daring the water to boil. Each new style of dancing involves slightly different body, body movements, but they are all basically sexual in appeal. Hugging and swaying to music, bumping and grinding, or suggestively gyrating produce sexual desires in the dancers' minds. Now watch this last part because it's what I really want to get to. No healthy man will deny that it is sexually arousing to watch a girl swing her hips and breasts to music. Men are not made of stone. And I would add that women are not made of stone either. And so when we think about it, why is, why is it wrong? Why, why should we not be participating in these kinds of things? It's because they bring up and bring out youthful lusts. What about in the area of sex education? That's another challenge. Remember that in the book of Genesis chapter 2 verses 24 and 25, God made them uh, male and female, made a man and wife. You leave the father and mother and, and you cleave the man, the husband cleaves to the wife. In the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 7 verses 1 and 2, Paul makes it clear that in order to avoid fornication, you have a husband or you have a wife. You don't just go out and fornicate with everybody and anybody. But even more than that, it seems some want you to believe that you can't tell whether you're a boy or a girl anymore. That you, that you have a choice. Now, as we think about that, God gave you some equipment when you were born. And if you can't tell one from the other, there is a really big problem. But the problem is not that you can't scientifically tell. It's because people have decided that they don't want to tell. And that is because they don't want what God says about our life. Again, when you, when you think about this matter, how does God view those who, shall we say, are struggling with their sexuality? their sexual identity. What does God think about the questions and issues surrounding gender identity and transgenderism? And if we can determine what God thinks, then we can determine how we are to think. We need to remember that God made a clear distinction. God created man in His own image, and the image of God created He Him. Male and female, He created them. He did not create 300 and some odd different genders. He created male and female. And even more than that, in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 22 at verse 5, look what Moses was commanded by God to write. A woman shall not wear a man's garment, nor shall a man put on a woman's cloak. For whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord your God. Folks, if you're interested in cross-dressing, transgenderism, you are in defiance of what God has said. I say that kindly, but I say it factually, and I say it so that we can understand it. God made it clear. Again, not only that, but when we see these kinds of things, we should not be judging too harshly. The Bible doesn't say don't judge at all. But the idea is don't judge harshly. And one of the reasons for that is this. In Galatians chapter 6 at verse 1, we may fall into the same, or not necessarily the same thing, but we may fall into temptation to sin ourselves. And so we have to be careful when we talk to people. Not only that, but as Christians we should be grieved. Grieved. Let's grieve deeply over the brokenness of our uh, our uh, communities and our nation and the things that in our culture have been taken over by the depravity of Satan. Let's be sure that we do that. In the book of Genesis chapter 6 at verse number 6, when the earth, the people of the earth were so horrible that God was about to destroy them, what effect did it have on God? Notice the last part of that. It grieved Him 
to his heart. And that's the idea that you and I are to have. We should react with love and care. Love and care. In the book of Ezekiel, chapter 18, at verse 23, Have I any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the Lord God? And not rather that they should turn from their way and live? God says, I don't enjoy when people who are sinners die because they have chosen a path that will lead them to destruction. Again, in Ezekiel 33, verse 11, Say to them, as I live, declares the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways. For why will you die, O house of Israel? Again, God wants people to be saved, not to be lost. And here's a point that I want you to get. <clears throat> if, if you miss everything else this morning, I want you to get this one. We live in a society that applauds people who come out, people who have the <clears throat> quote-unquote courage to stand up and, and, and defy society and defy God. But to applaud the so-called courage of one who comes out is one of the most cruel and heartless things that you can do. Now get that point. To applaud them in their sinful ways is one of the most cruel and heartless things that you as a person can do. It's no different than applauding a person for the courage to be a murderer because a murderer is a sinner in the sight of God. It's no different than encouraging or applauding a person to be a thief because these two are transgressions of God's law. But in reality, it is the same as cheering them on as they march steadfastly to eternal punishment. That's heartless and that's cruel. And that's not what Christians do. I see from time to time those on Facebook who write about somebody and their sexual identity struggle and they, they, they applaud them for that. And sometimes these are Christians who do that. Good friends, we can't do that. We have to have the moral courage to stand up. Not only that, to have the challenge of evolution and humanism. The Bible says in the book of Rome, uh, Psalms, rather, 14 at verse 1, The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They do abominable deeds. There is none who does good. Don't be a fool. In the book of Romans, chapter 1 at verse 20, the Bible makes it clear that we, is, and in his writing, the Gentiles of, uh, of, you know, the Old Testament and others, he said, for the invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. If you're sitting in a class, and, and I'm not sure that this happens much around here, hopefully it doesn't, but if you're sitting in a class that denies God and embraces evolution or humanism, you need to let your ears perk up and you need to go back and you need to find what God has to say and not what man has come up with. All of these, these five things, are areas in which we need to take our moral courage. As we close this morning, let me just simply say there is another school, and that's God's school. And we're lifelong learners in God's school. Jesus himself was a master teacher. Do you remember what Nicodemus said, John 3, verse 2? This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. We know that. Jesus is the master teacher. And as a result, we are living in God's school. Matter of fact, the very definition of a disciple is a person who learns from another by instruction, whether formal or informal, a pupil or a student. If you're a disciple of Christ, then that's simply saying, I'm a learner, I'm a student, I'm a pupil in God's school. 
That's what I am. But notice this. In the book of Matthew chapter 11, verse 29. In that plea that Jesus gives, He said, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Learn from me, the Master Teacher. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. If you'll listen to the Master Teacher, your eternity is guaranteed. And it's not in the place where you do not want to be. But as I close this morning, in God's school, we learn honesty and integrity. We learn respect for authority. And we learn moral courage. These are not just things we bring to church. These are things we carry every day. And they are things that we must carry to work or to school. And so I encourage you very, 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 very carefully this morning to consider these things. It may be today that you've never obeyed the gospel. We invite you to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Repent of the sins that you have in your life. Make the great confession. Be baptized for the remission of sins. If you'd like to study more, we'd love to study with you to help you understand why these things are required from God. And not only that, but if you have become a Christian in the past and you need to come back because you've committed sin in your life and you need the prayers of the church, whatever your reason may be, if we can assist you, come right now as we stand. Sundays we read prophecies regarding Christ's crucifixion. It's important that we read these prophecies because they prove that Christ was real. It proves that Christ was a man and it proves that Christ was crucified for our sins. In the book of John we will read where this prophecy was fulfilled. So they took Jesus and he went out bearing his own cross to the with him two others, one on the other side, and Jesus between them. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priest of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but rather... This man said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments, divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier, also his tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven one piece from top to bottom, so they said to one another, 
Let us not tarry it, but cast lots for it to see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture which says, They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So the soldiers did these things, but standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother, his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw that his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. From that hour the disciple took her to his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. He bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was a day of preparation, and so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. He who saw it has borne witness, his testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth that you also may believe. Let's go to Father in prayer. Our righteous Heavenly Father, we're so thankful, so blessed that your Son came to this earth. We're blessed that he was willing to take our place on, side, on that cross. We're blessed that he bare the sins of the world. Father, we're thankful for this bread which represents his body, and we pray we'll partake of it in a manner pleasing to your sight. In Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Let us give thanks for the cup. Father, we're thankful for this cup which represents Christ's blood. We pray that we'll partake of it in a manner pleasing in your sight. Christ, I do pray. Amen. Let's conclude the Lord's Supper. As a matter of convenience, we'll give thanks for the contribution. Father, we thank you for the nation in which we live. Father, we're thankful for the incomes that we have. Father, at this time we pray we'll give back to, your, to, back to you a portion which is rightfully thine. In Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Thank you, Mark for speaking to us God's Word and speaking the truth. We appreciate that very much. We have a thank you card from Bill Hyde, uh, actually from Miss Marlene Hyde, and she it'll be posted on the bulletin board. As you all know, she's recovering at home, and she wanted to thank everyone. Uh, I have a couple of announcements that I'm fixing to make and please listen closely and don't misunderstand and and uh, hear what I'm saying. Uh, the elders want to comment on the COVID uh, issues that we're now facing and we will continue to worship and study together uh, as we are, as we can, as long as we can. And we're recommending masks for inside the building. However, some of you may choose not to wear a mask. That's okay. We are recommending a mask uh, inside the building, a recommendation. 
If you choose not to, that's you. We do not want you to understand that we do want you to understand that we are consistently monitoring the CDC and the medical data that we have. As you all know, we have a number of medical people in our congregation and they do a good job of sometimes speaking to us and keeping us updated and, and giving us information that we can update with. And we appreciate all of them and the job that they do in a time like this. We pray daily that Every one of you will keep yourself and your family safe and healthy. And if you have any questions concerning this matter, please speak to us. Please speak to us and, and ask and let us have a talk to you about it if you don't understand. Masks are a recommendation. And if you choose not to wear one, that is your choice. Also, the most important announcement I'm making today is right now. <clears throat> the worship services and the time changes are going to be made on September the 5th. On September the 5th, our worship time will change. It will change, worship will change to 9.30 to 10 o'clock. Worship will begin 9.30 to 10 o'clock on September the 5th. 9.30 to 10.30. Thank you. 9.30 to 10. Y'all, y'all, I'll get it right. <laughs> Worship 9.30 to 10.30. That's why I got these notes and I'm not reading them. Uh, Bible classes will be from 10.40 until 11.30. Bible classes will be from 1040 to 1130. And our Sunday night worship, many have asked about that, have been concerned with Sunday night uh, Bible study. We will continue to have Sunday night Bible study at home virtually with Mark. So there will be no Sunday night worship. And we're increasing our, our worship and our time here uh, by a few minutes in Bible class and we can study together a little longer. Grant will have a closing song and uh, then we'll have our closing prayer by Charlie Dunn. Let's all stand and sing. come to you again thanking you for this day and for this opportunity that we have to gather together as brothers and sisters in Christ to hear another portion of your word to sing your songs of praise and to hear the lesson 
that was presented today. Father, we ask that the things that were said and done today were in accordance with your will. Father, we ask now that as we leave here that you'll watch over us as we travel to our homes and to the destinations that we're going to, and we, we ask that you'll see us safely back here at the next appointed time. Father, we ask that you forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' name, amen.